I'm a little slow and one-handed today. I had a procedure on my left hand this morning, so bear with me and I hope you can all hear me. Please join me in prayer. Dear Lord, when we open ourselves to you, we are blessed. Show us your way and deliver us from the painful mistakes that we make when we stray from your commandments. Let us live according to your word and let us grow in our faith every day that we live. Amen. I'm Grace Klaus, and it's so good to see all of you here today, members, friends, guests. We're so happy to have you here. I'd like to start by thanking Becca and Lee for our refreshments. And we, they went through everything to get here. Ubers weren't available. And anyway, they've made it with their Valentine cookies and homemade fudge. So if you didn't indulge yet, be sure and do it on your way out today. The majority of you know Hank Cherry. Um, Hank uh, has, has uh, been the director of communications for some time here at First Pres. He truly aids every organization here in communicating who, what, and where they are which aids every single member here. He holds a bachelor's degree in journalism, marketing, and communications from the University of North Texas. I could go on with more, but I don't want to steal any time from Hank, who has presented a great presentation for us today. So Hank, I'm going to turn it over to you now. Good afternoon. I um, want to thank everybody for being here. And I'd also like to thank Willie and Grace for the opportunity once again to present this month's book, The Tigers of Bastogne, Voices of the 10th Armored Division in the Battle of the Bulge. Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge a couple of guests with us today. Um, President of the San Antonio Rescue Mission and my dad, Jake Cherry and my stepmother, Marilyn. And uh, we have, oh yeah, my mom. <laughs> Jesse Killian. Let me tell you something, that, that lady, does, there's no one who defers more to be in a literature circle than that lady there. And she was born in a book in her hand. Okay. As you probably can imagine, there's hundreds, if not thousands, of books about this event in history. But I'd like to share just a, a few other books with you. Eric, can you get me the clicker? I left it up there. The first one is The Battle of the Bulge, Hitler's Last Hope by Robin Cross. Uh, this one provides good overall details of Bastogne and is very readable. Thank you. The second, Killing Patton by Bill O'Reilly and Martin Duggard. Uh, Bastogne is covered pretty well at the beginning of that book. Um, third is Alamo and the Ardennes. Uh, this book details the events prior to the Bastogne siege itself, and it includes some of the key players we'll be talking about today. Finally, To Save Bastogne. Uh, this one's been around a while. It's okay for military folks, but it's loaded with military terms and jargon, so it's harder reading. But otherwise, it tells the story really well in detail. So, we've got a lot of ground to cover, so let's get started. The Battle of the Bulge, when U.S. troops faced Hitler's last full-fledged counteroffensive in the West. It was the largest American battle of the war, involving at least a million men on both sides. However, aspects of the desperate, month-long fight continue to be unknown to the public today. 
The gallant stand of the 101st Airborne Division at Bastogne has become part of historical and media legend. But how many students of the war realize there was already a U.S. unit holding the town when the paratroopers arrived? And this unit, the 10th Armored Division, continued to play a major role in its defense throughout the German onslaught. In the Tigers of Bastogne, authors King and Collins finally detail the travails of this young armored division, which had only arrived in Europe that fall, yet found itself subject to the full brunt of Germany's 5th Panzer Army in the Ardennes. At first overwhelmed, and then falling back to protect the vital crossroads, the 10th Armored was ultimately reinforced by the Screaming Eagles, and its men and tanks went on to contribute largely to America's final victory. The 10th Armored Division's motto, terrify and destroy, was somewhat belied by the onslaught of na Nazi panzers that burst across no man's land on December 16th. Instead, their nickname, the Tiger Division, became fully earned as they went on the defensive at Bastogne, surrounded in that freezing winter by the Panthers and Tigers of Germany, yet refusing to concede a single inch of ground not earned by the enemy with blood. In countless lonely machines and foxholes, the Tigers refused to give another inch until finally the full force of Patton's army came to their rescue. General Anthony McAuliffe of the 101st Airborne and Nuts fame said, quote, it seems regrettable to me that the Combat Command B of the 10th Armored Division didn't get credit, didn't get the credit it deserved at the Battle of Bastogne. All the newspaper and radio talk was about the paratroopers. Actually, the 10th Armored Division was in there a day before we were and had some very hard fighting before we ever got into it, unquote. McAuliffe's gracious acknowledgement of the Tigers was only half the story, however, and it is only in these pages, through intimate soldiers' accounts, that the full story of the 10th Armored, Mar Armored's travail in the bulge is finally revealed. With their trademark style, authors King and Collins, through their first-hand interviews with veterans, bring us straight into the combats of the 10th Armored Division at Bastogne, equaling the balance between the brave paratroopers and gallant tankers, who together held off Germany's last major offensive in the West at its crux. Page 17. It's time to set the record straight and time to give credit where credit is due. The 10th Armored Division was different, from other, uh, was different from other U.S. Armored Divisions in many ways. The division enforced a strict disciplinary code that often exceeded written U.S. Army regulations. In combat, the soldiers of the Tiger Division often went above and beyond the call of duty and could ultimately be relied upon to perform their allocated tasks to the best of their ability. Captain John Drew Devereaux, a renowned Broadway actor and relative of Hollywood legend John Barrymore, said that the 10th Armored Division soldiers were expected to button their tunics up to the neck where soldiers and other units were allowed to leave the top button undone. Initially, Devereaux found this an unnecessary measure, but eventually came to believe that it gave the 10th Armored Division a smarter appearance than others. And there's more on him later. On 15 July 1942, the 10th Armored Division was activated at Fort Benning, Georgia. The 2nd Armored Division provided equipment and training areas for the new division. Officers from the 3rd and 11th Cavalry Regiments joined the original division cadre. Soon, men and equipment from across the United States arrived, and the, unit, the new unit took shape. The transition from civilian to soldier went quickly. Major General Paul Newgarden, the 10th commander, explained, quote, if we're gonna be successful, we must work like hell, play like hell, and fight like hell, unquote. The 10th did just that. Okay. Uh, under the leadership of Colonel William Roberts, uh, the 10th Armored Division consisted basically of three combat teams along with a reserve. 
which were formed at the beginning of the Bastogne defense. The first, there he is, this thing is jumpy. The first is Team, team Desbri, born in Manila, Philippines, on 11 December 1918 to Colonel and Mrs. E.C. Desbri. Unlike many of his contemporaries, Major Desbri was not a West Point graduate. In 1941, he graduated from Georgetown University School of Foreign Service, where he received a commission to the U.S. Army through ROTC. Although Desabri was not as experienced as team leaders O'Hara and Cherry, nevertheless, he displayed exceptional courage and fortitude when his team was assigned to defend, to defend the small village of Novo, just a few miles north of Bastogne, against overwhelming numbers. Today, there's a street in Bastogne named after him. All right, next, Team O'Hara, led by Lieutenant Colonel James Smiling Jim O'Hara. Lieutenant Colonel James O'Hara, commanding the officer of the 54th Armored Infantry Battalion, was known to his men for one simple physical attribute, his smile. Nicknamed Smiling Jim, no matter how serious the situation became, he always sported a reassuring grin on his face while providing first-class leadership. Born at West Point, New York on August 9, 1912, he was the son and grandson of West Point graduates. O'Hara completed his studies at West Point Military Academy in 1934. Thanks to his almost constant smile, his men found it difficult to discern his moods or the gravity of the situation. His remarkably, remarkably calm exterior, under pressure, earned him the loyalty and respect of his men. And finally, Team Cherry, led by Lieutenant Colonel Henry T. Cherry, Jr., or Hank. Uh, he was also the overall commander of the 3rd Tank Battalion, page 24. Lieutenant Colonel Henry T. Cherry had much in common with General George Patton, and that he liked to lead by the book. Born on 15 July 1911 in Macon, Georgia, Cherry was the oldest of CCB's three team leaders and a graduate of West Point, class of 1935. Cherry already had experienced heavy combat in November during the Battle of Metz, where he received the Silver Star in November. Lieutenant Colonel Henry T. Cherry, Jr., 3rd Tank Battalion, Silver Star Citation. For gallantry in action in France and in the, the vicinity of Merzut, Germany, during the period 16 November 1944 to 27 November 1944, Lieutenant Colonel Cherry, with other disregard for his own personal safety, led a rescue party over open ground to a hill occupied by the enemy 1,000 yards distant where he assisted in the rescue of a wounded officer who was in immediate danger of being killed by enemy fire. The rescue was performed in daylight under continuous heavy observed enemy artillery and mortar fire, projectiles of which burst as close as 10 to 15 yards from the rescue party. The gallant act of Lieutenant Colonel Cherry reflects great credit upon himself and the military forces of the United States, entered the military service from Georgia. Despite having a reputation as a hard taskmaster, a characteristic that did not particularly endear him to some of his soldiers, Cherry had a human side as well. William J. Brown, a company commander for B Company, 3rd Tank Battalion, wrote in the 10th Armored Newsletter, Tiger Tales, about Colonel Cherry's role in his wedding. Quote, in 1943, I had not had a furlough since joining the Army six months earlier. I put in for a 10-day leave to get married. I had been engaged to my fiance for one and a half years, and we agreed that if I became an officer, we would get married. My CO, Captain William Kistler, approved the request, but Colonel Cherry rejected it, saying I was too young to be married. After... Uh, after a month, my fiancé and I made arrangements through Captain Shepard, the chaplain, to be married. 
When, Lieutenant, when Colonel Cherry found out, he confronted me with the statement, quote, I thought I told you you were too young, unquote. My reply surprised when I informed him that he could not dictate my private life. He then asked if he was invited to the wedding. And as my bride's father could not be there, I told him that not only was he invited, he could give the bride away if he would. On April 29th, 1943, Cherry arrived at the chapel early and spoke to my bride at the back of the chapel. He then came down to the aisle and looked me in the eye and said, quote, do you still want to get married, unquote. After receiving an affirmative answer, he went back up the aisle and brought my bride down to me, unquote. These leaders and their soldiers, under the cover of anonymity to avoid detection by enemy forces, would be our first responders. And for the sake of time, and for selfish reasons, I'm going to focus more on the events of, with Team Cherry. But you can easily multiply the events by three as all teams face similar challenges. Ch Friday, 15 December. Note the chapters in the book are divided into each consecutive day of the offensive. Page 29. Tanks and armored units played an integral part in defending Bastogne during that dark, bitterly cold winter of 1944-45. The 10th Armored Division more than adequately lived up to its motto, terrify and destroy. They executed all the basic mobility, action, shock, and surprise elements of armored combat to the limit. The surprise element was achieved by doing the unexpected, maneuvering and firing while maintaining concentration of, of uh, firepower and speed. Successful armored in intervention depended primarily on combined arms, coordination of teamwork, deliberate planning, and violent execution. Unfortunately, due to the nature and urgency of the situation that began on 16 December, it wasn't always possible to do things by the book. Mistakes were made, indeed, and atoned for. The city of Bastogne lay directly in the path of the rapidly advancing German Fifth Army. Page 32. On 15 December, everything was quiet in Bastogne. Major General Troy Middleton had established, had established the Eighth Corps headquarters at the Heinz Barracks in the city, and all was well. Meanwhile, Operation Wacht am Rhein, or Watch on the Rhine, Hitler's ambitious plan to strike against the Allies and deliver a crushing defeat that would restore crumbling German morale, was poised to launch against the thin American line between Monschau, just south of Aachen, and Echternach on the eastern Luxembourg-German border. Okay, this map shows the setup. Uh, enemy, the enemy armies are shaded. The allies are not. This is Germany and the German line of armies. And these are the allies. This is Belgium. And more specifically, there's Backstone. Um, the lines indicate the goal of the offensive, which was to uh, reach Antwerp, basically a repeat of the Blitzkrieg. Patton's Third Army was way down here at the bottom of the page. The intention was to destroy 30 Allied divisions in one fell swoop. Hitler des designated four armies to execute his plan Consequently, neither the local population nor the Allies had any inkling that Germany was about to unleash a storm that would once again disrupt the tranquility of the centuries-old communities of the Ardennes. Saturday, 16 December. Page 38. At precisely 0530, on 16 December 1944, the men of the 106th Division were hit with a f the full force of an all-out Nazi offensive. 
the German advance through the Ardennes had begun in earnest as three German armies simultaneously launched their attacks along an 89-mile front against thinly held American line. The attack came as a complete surprise. The 10th Armored Division's Combat Command B was to play a prominent role along with the gallant 101st Airborne Division in holding Bastogne while the U.S. 3rd Army wheeled north to reinforce their position. Nevertheless, due to their excellent mobility, the 10th Armored was the first division to arrive on the scene and deploy to the assigned areas. Team Cherry After Action Report, December 16, 1944. Team Cherry received a warning order at 1830 hours from CCB, alerting them for movement to the vicinity of Luxembourg. Sunday, 17 December, page 45. As dawn broke, 17 December, at the 10th Armored Division camp in Remeling, France, disheveled GIs emerged from their tents in the brisk morning air. Raucous coughing, swearing, and spitting accompanied their current arduous revival to form as they surveyed the various forms of transport preparing to move north. Major, Major William Desabry, 20th Armored Infantry Battalion. Quote, O'Hara was now back in the 54th, and he was the lead guy. And a guy named Cherry was the second guy, who was the 3rd Tank Battalion commander. And then I followed with the 20th Armored Infantry Battalion. And down the road we went. And we were going at a nice clip, and we were sending billeting parties to find such and such a place and sp to spend the night. So we would set up there... We would bring the building party back, and they would say that you were going to another place. And this went on, and we were getting kind of exasperated. In fact, we were kind of running out of building parties because some of them couldn't get back in time to go to another place. And so I was getting kind of tired of it, and I went on up the head of the column to see what the heck Cherry knew. And I saw Cherry's Jeep parked at a Belgian's gas house. I guess it was up near Arlen, and so I pulled in, and there was Hank sitting in the gas house having a Belgian beer. So I joined him and asked him if he knew what was going on. And he said, quote, hell no, I don't know a damn thing, unquote. Well, there was a radio on, and I took enough French in college to sort of semi-translate the news. There was news coming over the Belgian civilian radio that there was a big German breakthrough in the Ardennes and advising people to move this and this and that and the other thing. And when I heard that, I said, quote, gee, Hank, do you think we go into First Army Reserve when all hell's breaking loose, unquote? And he said, quote, well, we better get back to the outfit, unquote. So he went back and joined his, and I joined mine, and later on, we got word to speed up the column and that we were going into the town of Bastogne. Monday, 18 December, page 53. Combat Command B of the 10th Armored Division was en route to Bastogne with all haste. Soldiers of CCB still had little knowledge of the magnitude of the current German attack, which was gathering momentum as the unsuspecting unit continued northward. Simultaneously, the column pressed on to Arlen, Belgium, just south of Bastogne, to await further instructions from the Corps commander. Sometime around noon, Major Johnson arrived at Corps headquarters. He was informed that there was still not enough intelligence regarding the full extent of the German attack. But the 8th Corps line was faltering badly to the east under the weight and ferocity of the German advance. Late on 18 December, as CCB's lead Sherman tanks, tank destroyers, and half-tracks rolled through Bastogne, on their way to the town of Noville, young Major William Desabry confidently addressed his hastily assemb assembled task force. Quote, put those tank destroyers on point and gather all the ammo you can lay your hands on. Good luck, and God be with you, unquote. He had no idea of the absolutely perfect storm of attacking Germans that was about to break around his small force. 
but he must have sensed that something big was about to go down because he incorporated infantrymen and engineers into the team's local defense. So CCB of the 10th Armored Division was split into three separate teams to help stop the German advance towards Bastogne. The teams were named after their respective commanders and mustered. Only 2,700 men in all were dispatched with all haste. Team Desabry, led by Major William R. Desabry, headed north to Noval, while Team Cherry wheeled east to Long Ville. Team O'Hara shifted southeast to Bra. Teams Desabry, Cherry, and O'Hara, supported by three batteries of the 420th Armored Field Artillery Battalion, were the first line of defense until reinforcements from the 101st Airborne arrived. CCB initially faced the full force of that German onslaught alone. The rest of the 10th Armored Division was held back in Luxembourg to prevent the Germans from swinging into Bastogne from the south. CCR had begun to withdraw at around 2339. Lieutenant Colonel Cherry received word from Lieutenant Hyduk after midnight that his and Captain Ryerson's forces were still holding Long Ville alone. This rather unwelcome news was supplemented by the report of a wounded tanker who had been hit near Majorey. This told Cherry that the Germans were getting behind his position and that he had witnessed a strong German presence in Majorey. The Germans now were now occupying the road between Cherry and his CP and Neff. This was the general situation on the night of 18 December. The three teams had made it to their pre-allocated positions intact. The problem was that they were too widely dispersed and their lines of communication were overextended. Their overall situation was impeded by a glaring lack of infantry support. Heading in their direction were aggressive and highly motivated German panzer columns, eager to seize Bastogne and still glowing from their initial successes against the Allies. Tuesday, 19 December, page 112. On 19 December at around 0700, General Barreline launched his Panzer Lear Division in an attack against Team Cherry in an effort to get through to Bastogne. As the Panzer Lear approached Neff, they were intercepted by heavy fire from the 1st Battalion, 101st PIR, which had arrived on the scene just a few moments before the attack commenced. Two platoons of German infantry, supported by two Panther tanks, then turned their attention to the large chateau that Lieutenant Colonel Cherry had been using as his CP. Eventually, it was on fire and under simultaneous attack from three, th three sides. Despite their desperate situation, however, the defenders refused to abandon Chateau Van Deskeren until late that evening after the German attacks had died down. As the hours passed, the paratroopers consolidated their positions and continued repelling attacks made by Panzer Lear. American artillery further frustrated German attempts to head west by shelling all roads leading to Bastogne from that area. Team Cherry after action report, December 19, 1944. Weather and visibility, poor, rain, foggy. At 13.07, Team Heideck was ordered to return to Neff by way of the Longville Bastogne Road and joined forces with Team Ryerson. Team Heideck at this time was receiving attacks from both flanks by enemy tanks, small arms fire, and being shelled by enemy artillery. Team Heideck reached Team Ryerson just west of Majorey, and the two teams consolidated at 1500. At 1900, Team Ryerson now consolidated with Team Heideck entered and held part of Majorey. At 2145, Team Ryerson was attacked again by enemy tanks and infantry. Continuous attacks were beaten off again by our forces in Majorey. Lieutenant Colonel Henry T. Cherry, Jr., Cavalry, 3rd Tank Battalion, Silver Star, Silver Star with Oak Leaf Cluster Citation. On 19 December 1944, in the vicinity of Neff, Belgium, 
while commanding a task force, he was informed of an enemy force hitherto undiscovered was approaching his position for an unprotected flank. Undaunted and with an indomitable fighting spirit, Lieutenant Colonel Cherry personally engaged the enemy with submachine gun and pistol fire. His fire dispersed the estimated 25-man group and permitted his own force to organize and meet the enemy attack. Later, when his small force was compelled to evacuate its position, Lieutenant Colonel Cherry moved forward and sprayed the enemy with submachine gun fire, reducing the enemy fire to enable his force to proceed with less harassing fire. The high degree of leadership, extraordinary fidelity, and untiring energy displayed by this officer were a constant inspiration to the personnel throughout his command and materially contributed to the successful accomplishment of the mission of the 101st Airborne Division. His actions were in accordance with the highest standards of the military service, entered the military service from Georgia. Okay, it's always good to find some humor in a bad situation. So, enter Captain John Drew Devereaux. Page 89. While, while Team Cherry was battling it out at Longville, Team O'Hara was struggling to gain the upper hand in Warden, which had the advantage of being closer to Bastogne. O'Hara had sent out another patrol. A Willie's Jeep containing two GIs approached the tiny village of Warden. They emerged from the fog, drove to the center of the village near the chapel, and stopped the Jeep. A few wary villagers left the safety of their cellars and approached the two Americans, Captain Edward A. Carrigo and First Lieutenant John Devereaux, were out doing a bit of recon. A number of curious locals crept out of their cellars and assembled around the stationary jeep. Never one to disappoint a gathered host and miss an opportunity to perform, Lieutenant Devereaux, an educated man and noted thespian, mounted the hood of the jeep and began to speak theatrically. Quote, have no fear, he said in quite good French. The U.S. Army is here to stay. You have nothing to fear. We shall protect you, unquote. He concluded with a low Jacobi, J Jacobian bow that almost caused him to lose his footing on the stationary vehicle. The impromptu audience cheered, waved, and even attempted to embrace the gratified actor and his companion. Well pleased with the result, and with the sound of his audience still ringing in his ears, Devereaux and Carago got back into the Jeep and drove east, back east into the fog from whence they came. Suddenly, their attention was diverted by the sound of approaching heavy engines. A shell burst onto their intended path, followed by a burst of machine gun fire. The two captains looked at each other in astonishment as muzzle flashes punctuated the gray gloom and machine gun bullets now tore up the ground around the jeep. Then they could make out the silhouette of a vehicle but couldn't ascertain whether it was an American or German one until they heard the voices. Quote, my God, those are Krauts, unquote, unquote, exclaimed Devereaux, wrenching the gear level into reverse and pressing the gas pedal onto the floor. Within seconds, they were whizzing back through Warden at full speed with Devereaux shouting to the locals, quote, get out of the way, you morons, the Krauts are coming. A little while later, the two officers were reporting their findings to Lieutenant Colonel O'Hara. He listened assiduously as Carrigo described the recent events and then thoughtfully turned to Devereaux with paternal advice. Quote, lay off the theatricals for the time being, son. It's distracting for the locals, unquote. Lieutenant Devereaux remained a popular and respected member of Team O'Hara for the duration, and he didn't have to prove his worth under fire. He'd already done that. Back at his CP in Bastogne, Colonel Roberts instigated plans to catch stragglers from various units who were drifting back to Bastogne. MPs were stationed at the road crossings in the south of Bastogne with instructions to stop every soldier 
who was trying to get away from the battle and turn him back to the combat command B area. Roberts managed to assemble around 250 men, some of whom were from CCR and the 9th Armored, with most from the 28th Division. This is how Team SNAFU, an acronym for Situation Normal, All Effed Up, came to be, and over the next few days, the ranks of this ad hoc unit swelled to number around 600 GIs. Team SNAFU was intended to be used mainly as a reservoir for the defending force. It was a temporary home for stragglers and other units, and other units were allowed to draw from it when they needed to. Wednesday, 20 December, page 123. On the morning of 20 December, General Middleton personally summoned Colonel Roberts to announce that CCB was now attached to the 101st Airborne Division. Middleton told Roberts, quote, your work has been quite satisfactory. I'm attaching to you to the 101st because I have so many divisions that I can't take time to study two sets of reports from the same area. Roberts immediately reported to General Anthony McAuliffe to organize the command liaison and remained at his headquarters for the duration of the siege. CCB was assigned the mission of mob mobile reserve to be held in Bastogne in readiness to counterattack when called upon to do so. Meanwhile, Team Desabri had retreated from Noville only to discover that the Germans had occupied the village of Foy. This subjected the fragile convoy to an even further running battle as they attempted to reach the relative safety of Bastogne. Out in Longville, Team Cherry was faltering, and Team O'Hara had so far failed to stop the flow of German troops and vehicles heading towards Bastogne. Due to various misadventures, Team Cherry could no longer tackle the approaching enemy. They now had to focus their energies on saving its remaining elements and covering its flanks in the rear. Whether the German advance into Bastogne from the east could be checked and thrown into recoil now remained to be seen. But as each hour passed, it became increasingly unlikely. General Anthony McAuliffe had his final meeting with General Troy Middleton on 20 December at his headquarters in Neuf Chateau. They discussed the current situation at some length, and as Middleton left, his parting but in res retrospect rather ominous, remark to General McAuliffe was, quote, don't get yourself surrounded, Tony, unquote. Page 141. After discovering that Team Cherry had passed through the village of Majoret, the Germans decided to set up their own roadblock and determined the best thing to do was to wait for the Panzer Grenadiers to catch up before attempting to capture Bastogne. Cherry soon established that elements of the Panzer Lear were now getting behind their position. Longville was now completely isolated, and it became vital for Team Cherry to attempt a breakthrough and reopen the road to Bastogne. By 23.30 hours, 20 December 1944, the enemy had succeeded in completely severing the bastogne neuf Chateau road, which had been the last route of evacuation to the rear. Bastogne was now effectively surrounded at all points of the compass. Thursday, 21 December. During the night of 2021 December, the Germans had successfully isolated Bastogne to the north and south. When their columns arrived from the east and west, the city was effectively under siege. The order for Combat Command B on December 21st was clear and precise. Quote, hold Bastogne at all costs, Un unquote. With the siege came a siege mentality. The people of Bastogne developed even more resilience and fortitude to combat the ensuing battle and terrible conditions that now prevailed. As the deep snow fell unabated, the temperatures dropped to record levels. They remained resolute and more determined than ever to see this through with their erst erstwhile companions from the U.S. Army. The conditions affected everyone and no one was immune 
to the soul-crushing cold that sapped the spirit and blunted the mind. Despite this, they gritted their teeth and fought on through. German artillery shells fell indiscriminately all over town, killing civilians and soldiers alike. Team Cherry After Action Report, December 21st. Weather and visibility, fair, cloudy. Team Ryerson ordered back to vicinity of CP Bastogne at 1,500 hours. Team Husted was attached, to, was attached to Team Cherry, and the team placed in Division Mobile Reserve, 101st Airborne Division. Team was placed on a 30-minute alert status to be prepared to counterattack the enemy in any direction. Bastogne under constant shelling at this time. During the night of 21st December, the Germans cut the bastogne Neufchateau Highway and completely surrounded Bastogne. Friday, 22 December, <clears throat> page 159. The Germans had already identified Bastogne as a major hazard to their progress. This fact was aggravated by newspaper headlines in the West beginning to report about the, quote, brave defenders of Bastogne, unquote, and comparing the siege to Verdun and the Alamo. These reports had come to the attention of Adolf Hitler, who was more than acquainted with the power of propaganda. He explicitly ordered that Bastogne should be captured. This mission was given to the German Fifth Army, commanded by General Hasso von Manchefell. General Baron Heinrich von Lutwitz, a corps commander, had specifically asked about Bastogne at a conference prior to the offensive. In the presence of General von Montefell, von Lutwitz was told that Bastogne would definitely have to be taken. Accordingly, in instructions to his subordinates, subordinates he stated, quote, Bastogne must be captured, otherwise it will be an abscess in the route for our advance and will tie up too many forces. Bastogne is to be eradicated first, then the bulk of the Corps can continue its advance." Unquote. On the morning of 22 December, sorry, the, a German surrender party, sorry, I'm, let me back up. On the morning of 22 December, a German surrender party consisting of two officers and two NCOs presented their surrender ultimatum. The ultimate said, in essence, that the position held by the 101st was hopeless and that if they refused to surrender, they would inevitably suffer the terrible consequence. Harry H. Kennard, Headquarters, 101st Airborne Division. Quote, My first reaction was that, th that this was a German ruse designed to get our men out of their foxholes, but be that as it might, we agreed we needed to take the message up the line. We took it first to the acting chief of staff of, of the division, Colonel, Lieutenant Colonel Ned Moore. With him, we took the message to the acting division commander, General Tony McAuliffe. Moore told General McAuliffe that we had a, ger a German surrender ultimatum. The general's first reaction was the Germans wanted to surrender to us. Colonel Moore quickly disabused him of that notion and explained that the Germans demanded our surrender. When McAuliffe heard that, he laughed and said, us surrender, all nuts. The note was then presented to McAuliffe that read, quote, to the USA commander of the encircled town of Bastogne, the fortune of war is changing. This time, the USA forces in and near Bastogne have been encircled by strong German armored units. More German armored units have crossed the River Our near Orthoville and taken Marsh and reached St. Hubert by passing through Homp Sibrit Tolay. Libremont is in German hands. There is only one possibility to save the encircled troops, USA troops, from total annihilation. That is the honorable surrender of the encircled town. In order to think it over for over a term of two hours, two hours will be granted with the presentation of this note. If this proposal should be rejected, one German artillery corps and six heavy AA battalions are ready to annihilate the USA troops in and near Bastogne. The order for firing will be given immediately after this two-hour term. 
all the serious civilian losses caused by this artillery fire would not correspond with the well-known American humanity, unquote. But then McAuliffe realized that some sort of reply was in order. He pondered for a few minutes and then told the staff, quote, well, I don't know what to tell them, unquote. He then asked the staff what they thought, and I spoke up, saying, quote, that first remark of yours would be hard to beat, unquote. McAuliffe then wrote down to the German commander, nuts, the American commander. Quote, Harper then put the German officers in a jeep and took them back to where the Germans, German enlisted men were detained. He then said to the German captain, if you don't know what nuts means, in plain English it means the same as go to hell. And I'll tell you something else. If you continue to attack, we will kill every GD German that tries to break into this city. Unquote. The German major and captain saluted very stiffly, and the captain said, we will kill many Americans. This is war. Harper then responded, on your way, bud. He then said, and good luck to you. Harper later told me he always regretted wishing them good luck. <laughs> there are many versions of this story, but the authors believe this to be the most accurate account. Sorry, getting ahead of myself. Page 164, Team Cherry after action report, December 22nd, weather and visibility, snow and limited. At 0450 hours, team put on a 10-minute alert status to attack in any direction. Two squads of infantry transferred from Team Husted to Team Ryerson because of depleted state of Team Ryerson. Transfer complete at 1,000 hours. Team alerted for counterattack to the southwest and stayed on alert throughout the day. Saturday, 23rd December. This was going to be a special day for the besieged inhabitants of Bastogne. Eyes filled with quiet expectation, gazed skyward hopeful, hopefully as the day began. On that day in Bastogne, the clear skies above filled with squadrons of C-47s roaring into view and dropping different colored parachutes. The chutes were color-coded to indicate their contents, such as medical supplies, ammunition, food, etc. The first of the carriers dropped six para packs at 11.50, and in little more than four hours, 241 planes had reached Bastogne. Escorting the cargo, airplanes were waves of P-47 fighters, which cavorted up unopposed up and down the perimeter, raking the Germans wherever they were exposed. The Air Force could now unleash its wrath with a vengeance, and as the day progressed, they dominated the skies above Bastogne, causing the Germans to scurry for cover wherever they struck. The real strength of the U.S. Army was in its soldiers' ability to improvise, which was the antithesis of the Germans, who were not renowned for their flexibility. The German assault would be led by a tank platoon, normally four or five panzers, followed by 50 to 100 infantry. If this first wave failed, a second or third, seldom larger than the initial wave, would be thrown into the fray. It is clear, however, that due to a lack of resources, the German commander and his troops were cautious about employing mass tactics at this stage of the game. Sunday, 24 December. Team Cherry was ordered to provide armor support for the 327th Glider Infantry in their bitter fight at Mar V. Team O'Hara's two Sherman tanks had greatly assisted the cause in this village by disabling three Mark IV tanks. This had discouraged further armored attacks, but the Germans persisted with infantry and intense artillery fire. It was not felt that Lieutenant Colonel Cherry's armored force could help much in the darkness, but their presence would have a profound effect on morale. It would be quite effective at daylight. Cherry's men and two batteries of the 81st Air 
anti-aircraft battalion formed a second line just above the village. On this map, uh, if you look, uh, December 24, you can uh, see the team's positions in and around areas, and this is the action at Marvy that we just talked about. And you can kind of see the maneuvering, being able to be in a position to go in any direction around the line. It was never really necessary to commit both armor and the anti-aircraft. The Germans repeated their mistake of attacking on only one front. Company A, 501st PR alerted from the now quiet Longville Road sector, counterattacked through Marvy and restored the 327th's grip on the situation. Cherry's men remained north of Marvy until 1325 that day when it became apparent that the Germans were all but finished in that sector. Five light tanks under Lieutenant Orangedorf took over and released Team Cherry to move back to Bastogne, where it returned to Division Reserve. Monday, 25 December. Page 197. There would be no Christmas truce in Bastogne. On the contrary, in fact, at 0350, the Germans seized the initiative to employ their armor over the frost-hardened ground, free from aerial harassment, and lost, launched a coordinated attack on the village of Champs, northwest of Bastogne. At the time, this sector was being defended by the 502nd PIR, supported by Troop D, 90th CRS, and elements of the 107th Tank Destroyer Battalion. Due to, overwhelming, due to the overwhelming onslaught of 18 hostile tanks at around 0700, American troops had been effectively pushed back east of the village. Confusion reigned for over an hour, but eventually all 18 German tanks were destroyed and most of the supporting infantry was killed or captured. The coordinated action of the paratroopers supported by 700, 705th tank destroyers had proven to be more than a match for the, attack, for the attacking Germans. Team Cherry was ordered up the line to provide additional support, but by 0800, the time they arrived, the fight was pretty much over. Team Cherry remained in position and kept a watchful eye on the situation for the rest of the day, returning to Bastogne at 1725. Robert Parker, Company C, 21st Tank Battalion, quote, President Roosevelt promised that everyone would have a for Christmas. And in Bastogne, a jeep pulled up and put a frozen turkey on the front of our tank. And we drove around with it on our tank from Christmas until January 12th. It never got warm, but he did keep his promise, unquote. Tuesday, 26 December, page 203. This was going to prove a landmark day in the history of the fight for Bastogne. In the wee small hours before dawn, German att Germans attempted yet another assault against champs. Thanks to, the thanks to decisive action that included direct fire from the artillerymen and the lightning swift maneuvers of the tank destroyers, the German intentions were foiled by 0800 the original perimeter had been restored. Meanwhile, yet another threat was materializing on the road to Mont at almost the exact spot that it had occurred the previous day. Team Ryerson of Lieutenant Colonel Cherry's reserve swiftly moved out of Bastogne to check the situation. At 1025, Ryerson's patrol encountered a substantial German force in the woods just 500 yards north of Isla Hesse. Throughout the morning, <clears throat> the team engaged the Germans by frontal assaults until the remainder of Team Cherry arrived at 1637 to counterattack around Ryerson's flank. By 1720, the enemy had been destroyed. In Bastogne, even the scarred and battered ruins appeared to be at the point of total collapse, as if they would shake off what little cement was holding their bricks together 
can simply collapse in a cloud of choking dust. To the observer, it felt as if everything within the town's perimeter was dying a wretched and pro protracted death. Page 203. Patton's Third Army had finally reached the perimeter of Bastogne. Right here. and breached the German lines that had been managing to hold the city under siege for over a week. The 4th Armored Division had bravely run the gauntlet and battered a narrow, precarious corridor through the German lines, and despite ensuing German efforts to close it, the corridor remained. The staunch defense of Bastogne had impeded the 5th Panzer Army's drive to the west, and Lieutenant Colonel Creighton Abrams' tanks broke through late in the afternoon of the 26th. Only 20 minutes later, Lieutenant Colonel Abrams was shaking hands with General McAuliffe, who had driven out to the front of the line to welcome the relieving force. The 101st greeting party, by McAuliffe's order, was well-dressed and clean-shaven in an effort to display that they had everything under control. Quote, gee, am I mighty glad to see you, unquote, said McAuliffe, Happy to, re, re, happy to be reconnected with the outside world. Profound respect and admiration had developed between the indomitable 101st Airborne and the 10th Armored Divisions. The 101st were destined to progress forward with the 3rd Army and assisted in driving the enemy further from Bastogne. Wednesday, 27 December. Page 212. Fighting continued around the perimeter of Bastogne as more reinforcements arrived and more German divisions were thrown into the fray. The Führer Beglet, or Escort Brigade, was ordered to stop their advance and head to Bastogne immediately. This particular order had come directly from Adolf Hitler himself, who had been informed of Patton's breakthrough. Due to a lack of fuel, the tanks of the Führer Beglet Brigade ground to a halt one after the other, and most of them would never even reach Bastogne. The intention was to use the brigade for the purpose of closing the gap in the encirclement around Bastogne by means of an attack in a southerly direction. To precipitate this, they would need to protect their flanks. They discovered to their dis dismay that the 26th Volksgrenadier were no longer in a position to offer effective support because they had been severely weakened by the preceding battles and didn't have the capacity to field any serious armor at this stage in the battle. Further, reconnaissance revealed that the high ground south of Chegnone would have to be captured and held for attack conditions to remain favorable for the Axis forces. Gradually, an air of, des an air of desperation began to permeate the ranks of the attacking Germans and severely beginning to affect the morale of these troops. The Siege of Bastogne was a battle that deeply affected both the local civilians and the soldiers unlike any other before. But more importantly, it forged bonds of lasting friendship between the two and that have survived the generations. There were many reasons for this, but the main one was, that, was the idea that, quote, a problem shared is a problem halved, unquote. The shared adversity and the resulting sense of comradeship from the incredible hardship they all endured remains a most poignant aspect of the siege, even to this day. Although many wounded soldiers were evacuated from Bastogne through Patton's Third Army Corridor, there were still plenty of replacements to integrate into the into the American forces due to the ferocity of fighting that continued around the perimeter. General Patton's relief of Bastogne has long become one of the legendary feats of the Battle of the Bulge, but even when Third Army forces broke through to Bastogne, he still harbored doubts about the eventual outcome of the battle. At one juncture, he was heard to say, quote, we can still lose this war, unquote, because Although he, effect, he had effectively carved a path through German lines, the fighting was still far from over. 
Thursday, 28 December. Although the 10th Armored Division was relieved by the 4th Armored Division on December 26th, the German bombing raids against Bastogne continued on with deadly results. At 7 in the morning, officers from Team Husted in Lieutenant Colonel Cherry's command post were caught in a German bombing raid. Five officers were killed, and the battalion's records were buried or destroyed. Warren Swainquist was standing in a doorway across the street, and Earl Van Gorp was in the building next door to the CP that morning. Sergeant Warren Swainquist, Headquarters, 3rd Tank Battalion, quote, I was in an apartment across the street from Cherry's CP. I went down to the basement to eat something, and when I came up, I was standing in the doorway, and the bomb hit across the street, and a hunk of shrapnel come along. I was leaning against the door jamb, and that damn chunk of shrapnel went right over my head and smashed into the doorway. Earl Van Gorp, Company D, 3rd Tank Battalion, quote, I was staying in a building in Bastogne, and there were five officers who were killed in a building right next to us that took a direct hit. The bomb didn't hurt us, but there was an awful concussion. We were in the cellar, and you had to lift yourself up off the floor. The shock wave took my breath away. D Company comprised of about 106 people, and only 24 escaped the Battle of the Bulge unwounded. Final chapter. Combat Command B of the 10th Armored Division had performed well and exceeded all expectations. It had cleared most of the roads to the north, while CCA and the 30, 35th Division had battered away against the German remnants that were clinging doggedly to the Arlen Bastogne Highway in the south. The battle wasn't over yet, but the proverbial tide had turned and the U.S. Army was sweeping in, witnessing the last dying gasps of a broken, dispirited enemy. After the 4th Armored Division broke through to Bastogne on December 26th, the majority of Combat Command B left Bastogne and traveled to their original positions near Metz, France, where they had left some two weeks earlier. But for select soldiers of Combat Command B, the battle still raged around the perimeter of Bastogne. Team O'Hara became the reserve force for the 501st PIR from January 1st onward. On 3 January, the 101st Airborne, along with elements of Combat Command B, began to drive the remaining pockets of German resistance from the Bastogne area. Page 229. Patton may have forced a corridor through to Bastogne, but now German divisions began to descend on it like flies around a muzzle of a snorting bull. The east side of the corridor ref deflected the repeated blows of an attack made by two Volksgrenadier divisions supported by elements of the 5th Intra Infantry Division. Through the dense fog, they stormed into Lutrebois just six kilometers south of Bastogne and only 1,200 meters from the main highway. The confrontation that followed was the result of a carefully executed ambush orchestrated by six M4 Sherman tanks. Using the fog for cover, they positioned themselves on the edge of the woods at Lutrebois. As German Mark V Panthers moved forward in twos and threes, the Shermans opened enfilade fire that destroyed all the German tanks without sustaining a single loss to their own armor. The 35th Division, supported by low-flying P-47 Thunderbolts, incapacitated 55 German tanks on that day. The German offensive was grinding to a gasping halt. As orders from OKW began to filter through the German ranks to pull back behind the Siegfried line along the German border. Hitler was exasperated and bitterly disappointed by this defeat, but in a rare moment of lucidity, he decided to cut his losses and prepare for the final battle. Page 233. As the veterans of the 10th Armored Division gather for their annual meeting, no one can fail to notice their dwindling numbers, 
Nevertheless, the esprit de corps of these men is every bit as all-encompassing and cohesive as that of the as that of the illustrious 101st Airborne. More so, in fact, because the 10th Armored Division were never really venerated to any great extent for the sacrifices they made and the challenge they ultimately met with exceptional courage and fortitude. The authors worked hard to get a memorial plaque placed for the 10th Armored Division and are glad we did. They deserve our profound respect and admiration for a task they performed during that bitterly cold winter all those years ago. The plaque reads, the U.S. 10th Armored Division Com Combat Command B, the first major combat unit to defend Bastogne, arrived on the evening of December 18th, 1944. Colonel William L. Roberts deployed his combat command in three teams, Team Desabri at Noble, Team Cherry at Neff and Longville, Team O'Hara at Warden and Marvy. After delaying the initial German advance, the remnants of these 10th Armored Div teams joined the U.S. 101st Airborne Division for the remainder of the siege. In recognition of their gallant actions, Combat Command B was awarded the Presidential Unit Citation. Dedicated by the 10th Armored Division veterans, December 10th, 2011. I'm not going to try to read the French side. <laughs> Today, Bastogne is a busy little town that he is with visitors at the weekends. The car park on the McAuliffe Square quickly fills up, and the cafes and snack bars in the vicinity, in the vicinity do a lot of business. One doesn't have to walk far to see the stars and stripes hanging outside the town hall and various other establishments. In fact, Everywhere you look, there are constant reminders to what occurred during that fateful winter of 44-45. The locals are relatively friendly, but knowledge of English isn't universal, so it's always good to know a bit of French. The veterans who we recorded were ordinary people that just happened to be there at the time. Nothing special about that, but they were, quote, special. They know things that we'll never know. They saw things that hopefully we'll never see. And they all deserve to rem be remembered. Remember them, be proud of them, respect their deeds, and don't let the world forget. That's the least we owe them. OK, real quick. Um, this is a photo that we have. It's a photo of General Patton awarding Lieutenant Colonel Henry Cherry the Distinguished Service Cross, it's there. Uh, this was presented in Germany after the Battle of the Bulge and the taking of Trier. Patton's two, tank fake, uh, Patton's two favorite tank commanders were Creighton Abrams and Granddad Hank. This is the Mardassan Memorial at the Bastogne Memorial Museum, which pays tribute to the Allied soldiers who died or got wounded. You will note the states of the USA listed across the top, all the way around the structure, which is star-shaped. OK, before closing, we would like to present a final voice from General Anthony McAuliffe himself, paying tribute to the heroes of the 10th Armored Division. didn't get the credit it deserved in the Battle of Bastogne. All of the newspaper and radio talk was about Carrickford. Actually, the 10th Armored Division was in there a day before we were and had some very hard fighting before we ever got into it. And I sincerely believe that we would never have been able to get into Bastogne if it had not been for the defensive fighting of the three elements of the 10th Armored Division who were first in the Bastogne 
and protected the town from invasion by the Germans. What is it, guys? Go to the radio room. Welcome to the studio. Um, in his book, A History of Warfare, British Field Marshal Bernard Montgomery wrote, quote, however skillful the general may be, there comes a stage in every battle against a determined enemy when victory hangs in the balance. The power then is out of the hands of the general and goes finally to the soldiers. Victory will depend on their courage, their training, their discipline, their refusal to admit defeat, their steadiness and tenacity in battle." Unquote. In closing, there were a lot of great moments in the history of World War II. North Africa, D-Day, VE Day, Okinawa, Japanese surrender. But for me, and I'm a bit biased here, this was the greatest moment for America in World War II. Where few stood against many, where Americans alone stood their ground with the locals of Bastogne, riding out Germany's all-out attacks, responding valiantly and stopping what could have been a real prolonging of the war, giving Hitler more time. This, for me, was America's greatest moment. Thank you for your time today. for questions, for sharing this bit of history and how important it, and making it clear to us how important it really is. And I think we all really enjoyed it. Um, and now I'd like to call if there's any questions or comments anyone would like to make. Jane. Um, hi, this is brother-in-law who was in the Army, but he was a CPA and had um, an inside job doing some kind of accounting. Mm -hmm. and suddenly uh, an officer tore into their um, facility and said, you've got to get out right now. They did, and they grabbed a, a gun and ran away, and he got caught out there in the Battle of the Bulge with no coat, and we all saw what, what they were dealing with with the weather. But when he came home, this was the interesting part, he told his wife that he never wanted to be cold like that again. Mm -hmm. And they moved from Chicago to St. Petersburg, Florida, and lived there for the rest of their lives. And there are a couple of things that are really important about the Battle of Bastogne that is rarely mentioned. One of the, I think everybody can hear me, one of the reasons it's so important I mean, They said that also it was a goal of Hitler to, to get, to if they succeeded in that, he would sue for peace. So it was basically his, his opportunity to delay, to prolong.
I'm Jake Cherry. That's my dad, my hero, right there. The year 1950, we were stationed at West Point. My, uh, Hank was the head of the armored department there. Happiest two years of my childhood. The mountains, the Hudson River, sports, uh, everything for a kid. But this is what I want you to hear. How many here have been to West Point? You know it. Know where the uh, parade field is and all of that, and where the cadets are at night and then whatnot. Well, the PX, I don't think it's there anymore, but it was there this night. I was 10 years old, and the two of us were together picking up something from the PX. We came up, we looked across the, the deal at the, the lights and everything, and I do not know what I said because his answer has overwhelmed me for over, what, 70 years now? Because I was 10 years old. I asked him a question about World War II. I don't recall what it was, but this answer is the best definition of courage I have ever heard. He said, I was scared every minute. And I think as Jane pointed out, your slides, Hank, mm -hmm. were just, just brought the realism of what it was like. You can hear it was winter time, but to actually see those pictures and imagine is just tremendous. Anybody else have anything? Um, yes, I just wanted to say I brought my cousin here today, um, Julie McCarty. She is a member of St. Mark's Presbyterian in Bernie. And her father was a part of the 12th Armored Division, which came in after the 10th. And they were in a battle at that same time near here. And he was um, joined the Army as a young college student at Texas A&M. And so Julie has a lot of World War II history knowledge. Um, the 12th Armored has a museum in Abilene because that's where they were stationed or where they did their uh, training at Camp Barkley outside of Abilene. And there is a museum there. And throughout the years, her parents and then her, she and her sisters, their annual reunions that they attend and now their children and the grandchildren of these um, veterans are all part of these reunions. And it's a really, it's a great story. And uh, I, I guess in starting in about the 1990s, um, her father and mother would travel back to Germany. And in, on his trips, he was able to do some research. And in a, in a town near there, which, Nazig, he was able to meet a, a German soldier, and they developed a very strong friendship. And after her father passed away, Julie and her sister went over and visited with him, and they continued the friendship with him and his family. And that, to me, was just a very poignant story about his experiences and how he was able to overcome all that he went through. But he said the same thing about the cold, too, didn't he? Yes. he yes. <laughs> Saved us from it. <laughs> but he said the same thing about the cold. Yeah, it was very cold. <laughs> so, thank you. Thanks, Shelley. You know, I was just thinking, isn't this really what history is about? That we remember and don't forget. Thanks, Hank. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Next month, for those of you that are able to make it, we'll be reviewing um, The Book Lady of Troublesome Creek, and then Jan Hansen will be with us again. Thank you all for coming, and enjoy some more treats that are still over there. Enjoy the rest of your Valentine Day. Thank you. <laughs>